Um, yeah, like this. So I have some videos. Sure. And um, I know that we're on a remote connection, so there might be some, you know, some lag in there, but hopefully not too much to ruin the visuals. Uh, so today I wanted to talk about observing the largest structures in the universe. It's very, it's kind of the broader field that I did my PhD in. Um, and, you know, in general, what I want to cover is, you know, what is the largest structure in the universe? Uh, why is it important to us to observe it? And um, what are the kind of instrumental methods that we use? I know that this is a group that's very interested in like hands-on observing and kind of uh, instrumentation. And so I wanted to stay focused on the kind of how do we actually trace this stuff and how do we measure it practically? Um, but I have stolen a lot of great visuals from the theorists. So uh, they you know, deserve all the credit for the, for the nice videos. So what you're seeing in the background here is some of that structure as it evolves through time. And uh, I'm gonna come back and show some more videos about it, but some of you may be familiar with the term cosmic web, or even the instrument at Palomar, the cosmic web imagers. Uh, that's my advisor built as a PI of those instruments and our research group focuses on that uh, kind of observation. So uh, let me see, can I click to the next slide? Okay, so the early universe was quite uniform in density. We know this from the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is something that if uh, anybody has questions about, I'm happy to kind of get, get into later on. Um, but basically we have some good observational evidence that the early universe was smooth in temperature or density to within 10,000. And over time, what happened is the tiny over density. So these, there were small regions that were just a little bit like one part in 10,000 more dense than the adjacent region or less dense than the adjacent region. And those came from quantum fluctuations that got blown up during the Big Bang, during inflation. So in the very early universe, just imagine the universe as this kind of soup, this gas that is spread almost perfectly evenly everywhere, but maybe in one place there's like one extra atom. There's just a tiny, tiny over density in somewhere. And what happens is regions that are slightly more dense will exert a, a larger gravitational pull. And so they will pull more matter towards them. And as they do, they get even more dense and they get an even stronger gravitational pull. And so you have this runaway class where the more dense regions become ever more dense and these kind of under dense regions become these big voids. And so what happens is kind of, you can see this visual here, there are like three cubes and moving from left to right is kind of from early universe to late universe. So in the early, and this is a simulation, so you're seeing kind of real physics play out here. It's not, not just an animation. And so you see on the left-hand side, there's the kind of, you know, it's kind of messy. It's not a perfectly smooth because it's not, it's, it's not exactly at the very start of the universe. But as it goes on, those differences become more exaggerated. And on the right-hand side, you end up with this web-like structure, this kind of filamentary structure where all of the gas has collapsed into these regions, uh, these concentrated regions. And because of the structure of this, it looks quite spider webby. We give it the nickname, the cosmic web. And so this is on a very, very large scale. If you look at the small dots in here, these are like the small dots on the right hand side that you see are galaxies and clusters of galaxies. So this is some of the largest scale structure in the universe. Here is, um, a snapshot from the Millennium simulation, which, which used 10 billion particles uh, and put in like the laws of gravity and, and other physics to trace the growth of this structure. So it starts off at about 180 million years after the Big Bang, which does sound like a long time after the Big Bang, but in cosmological terms, that is quite close to the Big Bang because the universe is more than 13.5 billion years old. So this is fairly early universe, we would say at a redshift of about 20, or in more intuitive terms, when the universe is 180 million years old. And we're going to watch this initial density distribution uh, kind of collapse into more and more structure as the physics uh, takes hold. So I'm going to press play here. And first, all you'll notice is the, the brighter regions, the more dense regions start to become brighter, but you'll eventually see the gravity start to pull things together. And you should gradually see these regions start to collapse in on themselves. And so what you're seeing is formation 
large scale structure, the formation of the cosmic web. And um, so ultimately, uh, this really kind of plays out primarily with dark matter in the early universe, because dark matter dominates the mass budget of the universe. Um, but then all of the gas and the other matter kind of follows that. So it happens to both. But uh, we typically, when we see these simulations, what they're actually showing you is what's happening with dark matter. Uh, you can assume that the same thing more or less happened later on with the um, gaseous material like, you know, atoms. Um, and so it forms this cosmic web. This here is a snapshot from a much more recent simulation, uh, Illustrious The Next Generation or Illustrious TNG. And you can see the cosmic web in a lot more detail. And you have these filaments. So we call these kind of filaments. We also call when you have like a big sheet of this gas, we call it a pancake. Um, and basically galaxies and clusters of galaxies form where these filaments intersect. Um, so if you see, I don't know if you can see, can you see my mouse? Yes, yes. And so I'm moving my mouse around in the center here and around here, this would be a cluster of galaxies at the center where these kind of cosmic web filaments have intersected. And um, this is the kind of the big picture. If we want to understand questions, I think, you know, one question that's at the core of a lot of astrophysics is how did we get here? You know, how, where did we come from? How did the Milky Way get here? And when you're looking at the big picture like this, this is the context that provides us the clues to understand how the Milky Way formed and how the Milky Way evolved. This is where all of it started. This was where the gas comes from that fuels star formation in the Milky Way and, and in other galaxies. Um, and what's really neat is that if we do a survey of the positions of galaxies and their distances and map them out, this is what we're seeing here, you can actually see the structure of the cosmic web in real life. So what I've shown you up until now has just been simulations. But what you're looking at now is a real map of galaxy positions. And you can see the structure of the cosmic web in uh, by proxy here. So what you're not actually seeing any of the gas. Each dot here is a, is a galaxy. Um, and so what you're seeing is that there is some structure. We call this, uh, I think it might be this one over here, has been nicknamed the Great Wall. Um, and you see kind of these large structures in the overall distribution of galaxies. And uh, you can also notice that as you go farther away, so we're, we're at the center of this map, and obviously the farther away you go outwards, the more distant those sources are, which means the longer it has taken for light to reach us from those. So there's this common trend in astronomy that, you know, the farther away you look, the farther back in time you're looking because it has taken photons, it has taken the light quite a way. We're seeing like the sun as it was eight minutes ago. And if something is a billion light years away, then we're seeing it as it was a billion years ago. So if you look at the kind of, uh, as you go farther and farther out in this map, there is kind of less and less structure, or it, it appears to be a little bit more concentrated at the center. And that's kind of, you're kind of seeing uh, some of the evolution of, uh, oh, this is, this is pretty low redshift actually, so maybe that's more a matter of not having enough sources. Um, but one of the things, one of the complications here is we can't see the gas very easily. On the left-hand side in this simulation, you're seeing the kind of simulated visible light. And on the right-hand side in the simulation, you're seeing the actual gas density. And so when we look at the sky, at, even if we wanted to just stare at these galaxies, it's not easy to see the gas that's connecting them. It's just incredibly faint. And it's in incredibly faint for two reasons. First of all, it's, it's very, very low density. So there's not a lot of hydrogen, even though it's mostly hydrogen, there's not a lot of it. It's very, very uh, low density gas. And the other thing is that there's not much illuminating it in this kind of big intergalactic space. You know, when it's a right around a galaxy, then it's illuminated. But once you go outside the galaxies, there's really nothing to light it up. And so it's a major observational challenge to observe this stuff. And we really want to observe this stuff because we want to understand how galaxies form. Here's another simulation of a galaxy forming. Uh, it's kind of a zoomed in simulation. And what you're seeing here is gas flowing in from the cosmic web. You're see seeing two different angles of it. 
And as the gas flows in, you see these explosions coming out. That's from supernovae and uh, the feedback as stars form. And, but still, the gas keeps flowing in. Eventually, you start to build up this rotation in the center. And what you're going to see towards the end of this video is the formation of a galactic disk, like Andromeda or like the Milky Way. <clears throat> and so you can see that it's a very complicated process. It's very messy. All of this gas that's kind of out around the edges, if we were to look with just visible telescopes, we would just not be able to see. Uh, by now, you can start to see the formation of the galaxy at the center, this little uh, disk of gas rotating around. So to understand how the Milky Way formed, we'd need to be able to see this process play out in real life. But it's just extremely difficult to do. So how do we observe this kind of gas? Well, there's always two steps in trying to observe a physical phenomenon. First, you need to pick an observable tracer of the gas. And then obviously, second, you need to pick the best observational method to observe that thing. So let's deal with the first part first. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe because in the very early universe, we had uh, something called Big Bang nucleosynthesis or primordial nucleosynthesis, which is essentially the first atoms that formed before there were any stars, before there were any you know, galaxies. And the vast majority of material in the universe, uh, that is baryonic material, I'm, not, I'm putting aside dark matter and other things for now, it, three quarters of the atoms in the universe are hydrogen atoms. So if we want to look at the cosmic web, <clears throat> it would make sense that hydrogen would be the first go-to in terms of what's going to be the brightest, what's going to be the most readily available source that we can look for. Okay, so let's say hydrogen atoms make, you know, if we can observe those, those would be ideal tracers of the cosmic web. So how do we observe hydrogen atoms? Well, uh, atoms can emit and absorb radiation. And basically a hydrogen atom is just a proton and electron that are bound together. Now, when the electron changes energy levels, that's associated with the emission and absorption of light. So the most abundant hydrogen emission comes from this transition where the uh, electron goes from the second energy level to the first energy level. And um, it emits a photon we call Lyman alpha. Lyman alpha has a wavelength of about 121 nanometers, 121.6 nanometers, which puts it in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. So hydrogen Lyman alpha is a good tracer of the cosmic web because hydrogen is abundant and this is the most abundant source of emission for hydrogen. Um, <clears throat> and there are kind of two ways to look at atomic emission or absorption. You can either see it uh, to look for Lyman alpha or to look for any hydrogen line, you could see it in emission or absorption. So because the atoms have these quantized energy levels, they only emit or absorb a specific wavelengths. And other sources like stars or galaxies kind of emit at a broad range of wavelengths. So on the top here, you're seeing an example of what a spectrum might look like if you disperse the light from a, a nebula and you see uh, the atomic emission, there's only certain specific colors or wavelengths that are emitted. Whereas on the bottom, if you had some background source illuminating a cloud, and then that cloud absorbs certain photons, then what you would get is a full kind of rainbow of color where those atomic uh, uh, transitions are missing. So you kind of, you can look at an emission spectrum or an absorption spectrum. And I know some of this is kind of uh, well known to, to a lot of you, or maybe all of you, uh, but I'm kind of trying to go just through the, uh, the fundamentals of, of this observe, uh, observing process. So we're going to target atomic hydrogen in order to observe the cosmic web. And we know that we can see these in either emission or absorption. And those are the two main categories. And so what I want to do for the rest of the talk is look at the methods we use uh, in emission and absorption to trace the cosmic web. So first, the absorption methods. Uh, for this method, you need a background source that emits continuum emission. And essentially what you have is imagine there's some extremely distant galaxy or extremely distant source that emits at all wavelengths. As it travels through the universe towards us, it passes through the cosmic web in various places. And when it passes through that gas, the gas absorbs some of the light. So by the time it reaches us on Earth, it has imprinted in it the signature of the cosmic web wherever it has been absorbed along the way. And 
there's a, kind of a lot of additional complexity to this in terms of determining where exactly those uh, absorption lines occur. But the kind of in a nutshell version of it is that if you look at a distant enough source so that there's some cosmic web between you and the source, then you can see absorption lines which show where the cosmic gas kind of uh, absorbed some of its emission. So quasars provide the best opportunity to do this. Quasars are galaxies containing supermassive black holes, which material is falling onto. And as the material falls into the black hole, it emits this hugely energetic radiation. And so the, the, the reason quasars are useful is kind of twofold. First of all, they're some of the brightest objects in the universe. But second of all, we can see these bright sources in the distant universe, billions of light years away. So this means that there's a lot of cosmic web between us and the quasar. So they make great candidates for absorption studies. So if you're observing a quasar that's, you know, 10 billion light years away, you can probe 10 billion light years distance worth of the cosmic web. Think of it just as a probe. You know how when they take uh, core samples, like ice cores in Antarctica or in, in the Arctic? It's kind of basically the same thing. You're taking a one-dimensional slice through the universe by looking at emission from this source. So here's kind of a visual illustration of what happens. We are over here on the left. I think that's the, the Hubble telescope. And we're looking through a particular portion of the universe. And you can see the cosmic web kind of colored in here. Now in the distance, in the distant universe, there's a quasar. And we see that the quasar emits at all wavelengths. As the light from the quasar travels towards us through the universe, it absorbs, it gets, uh, the light gets absorbed by the cosmic web more and more. So the more it travels through the universe, the more different kind of absorption lines show up in that emission. So by the time the quasar emission reaches us, it started off looking like this rainbow up here, but by the time it reaches us, it has all of these absorption lines from the cosmic web. And we can use those absorption lines to study the uh, intergalactic medium, which is another name for the, the cosmic web. Um, <clears throat> and here we have two different quasars. These are the spectra of two different quasars. So rather than showing this as, you know, the color map, I'm showing this as a kind of a plot of the flux. And essentially what you see in the top quasar, which is actually the first quasar ever to be identified by uh, Martin Schmidt back in 1953, um, we see that there are some absorption features on the kind of left-hand side of the spectrum, because this is actually a fairly close by quasar. So it doesn't have a lot of cosmic web between us and it. It's not in the very distant universe. But on the bottom panel, you see a much more distant quasar. And in this quasar, you see a lot of absorption lines. And so all of these absorption lines on, on the bottom panel come from the cosmic web. So um, Gunn and Peterson in 1965 published a paper where they used a quasar like this to obtain the first ever measurement of the density of intergalactic material, um, which was kind of a groundbreaking moment because one of the things they realized was that the density of neutral hydrogen in intergalactic space is incredibly low. If, if it wasn't, um, you would expect it to absorb pretty much all of this light. But what they found when they did this study was that there actually has to be very, very little neutral hydrogen in the cosmic web. It's almost all ionized. So absorption studies are a really important method for us to study the cosmic web and the intergalactic medium. Um, and even today, they still form uh, an extremely important basis because we have hundreds of thousands of quasars in these large databases like the Sloan Quasar Catalog or SDSS Quasar Catalog. And we can use each of those to give us a different line of sight through the cosmic web. So by using hundreds of thousands of quasars, we can build up a three-dimensional picture uh, of the cosmic web. <clears throat> but of course, what you're gonna maybe notice from this is that it doesn't give you an image. It would be nicest really to have an image of the cosmic web, but like something that is much more intuitive, much more visually useful, because you know we're visual beings. We kind of, we communicate information very well. We absorb information very well by being able to map it out. Um, so in order to make maps, in order to make images of the cosmic web, we need to look at emission instead. And the advantage of emission is in an absorption case, 
you're really only looking at one point and you're seeing, okay, where did light get absorbed from that one source? But in emission, you can create a full two-dimensional image if it's bright enough for you to target. Um, <clears throat> so there are two main categories of method for emission. This is one that many of you are probably quite familiar with, uh, which is narrow band imaging. If you say want to take a, you know, an image of the Orion Nebula in an hydrogen emission, you might use like a H alpha filter, H beta filter, which would be a hydrogen filter. So basically, a narrow band filter. They're expensive to make, uh, which is one of the drawbacks of them. But a narrow band filter only allows a small range of wavelengths to pass through, something on the order of 0.3 nanometers. Um, so, you know, 30 angstroms to 40 angstroms, um, or 0.3 to 0.4 nanometers. So, this is one way you can do it. If you know exactly what wavelength the emission is going to be at, you can construct a narrow band filter to isolate that emission and then just pop it into a camera go and try and image the cosmic web. This method is good because it is efficient. All you have is a filter and a camera. And so there's not a lot of complicated optics happening. It's just simple. You just, it's kind of like one of the most, you know, I think generally the simpler an optical setup is, the more efficient it's going to be. You don't have more mirrors where you can lose uh, efficiency. You don't have, uh, you know, different gravings or different optical elements where you can kind of lose some light. So um, custom filters can be designed to allow only a narrow range of wavelengths to pass through, and we can design those to target the atomic hydrogen emission. Uh, this image that you're seeing here is one of the first very kind of large detections of a portion of the cosmic web through narrow band imaging. It comes from a Sebastiano Cantalupo et al. Back in 2014, they used the VLT, I believe, down at the European Southern Observatory um, <clears throat> to study this nebula called the Slug Nebula. And while it's nowhere near on the same scale as the simulations I was showing you before, it is one of the most significant or the earlier most significant detections of uh, a filament of the cosmic web as it connects to a galaxy. Now, the two bright sources you see in this image are quasars. So the reason you can see this gas is that the gas is illuminated by the quasars. Typically, this gas would be too faint to actually observe like this, but the quasars just boost it by orders of magnitude so that we can actually detect that flux in a reasonable amount of time. So this was a pretty significant discovery um, because at this, the size of this nebula is about 400 kiloparsecs. For reference, I think the Milky Way is about 30 kiloparsecs in size. So this is on the order of, you know, tens of galaxies in size, uh, more or kind of on the order of the dark matter halos that surround galaxies. Still what we would call the um, circumgalactic medium. So the cosmic web is kind of made up of two constituent parts. There's the intergalactic medium, the gas between galaxies that's just floating out there in space. And then the circumgalactic medium is a bit different because it's close enough to galaxies that it gets enriched by outflows, where like uh, the heavy elements that are formed by stars like carbon and oxygen and everything get kind of blasted out and mixed up with that gas. So this gas would be circumgalactic medium. So it probably has helium and carbon and oxygen. It's not like the true intergalactic medium out in the middle of nowhere. Um, but still, it, it was a very significant uh, observation in, in terms of getting towards a more complete picture of the cosmic web. The other method that we can use, and this is the getting into what I did in my thesis, is spectroscopy. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the, the basic concepts of spectroscopy, you, um, or, or at least the Pink Floyd uh, album cover. But you kind of, um, you, you know, you take a light source and you split it into its constituent uh, parts. And in terms of what we want to do, the, the powerful aspect of this is that we can select with which wavelengths we want to study just by kind of moving the camera around. So you see, as an example here, right, we have a white light source hitting a prism and then it's getting dispersed into its red and blue wavelengths. Imagine we place a camera wherever we want along this axis we can move that camera to focus on blue light or red light or green light, or, you know, the more, the more we disperse the light and the more sent we can control the camera, the more we can control exactly what wavelength range we see. And this gives us some flexibility. Narrow band images 
are good. And if you have a filter that's ideal, then that's great. But oftentimes you don't know exactly what wavelength you want to observe. So spectroscopy gives you this extra flexibility where you can look at a wider range of wavelengths and then focus in on the ones where the emission appears. And so there are a number of ways to do spectroscopy, but they all boil down to uh, how you break up the field of view before you do the dispersion. Uh, so essentially, imagine you have a star, right? You can take all of the light from that star, put it through a prism, and then you'll get a single spectrum out. But you won't get any spatial information. You won't be able to measure the size of the star or see anything around the star. You would just get a point source that you're dispersing. That's the kind of simplest version of spectroscopy. Um, uh, so first I want to cover some, some of the basics of spectroscopy because we're going to start looking at data formats that are not very intuitive. Once you get into looking at wavelength as an axis and space as another axis, it starts to become less intuitive compared to images. So I want to kind of step into this carefully. Um, <clears throat> so imagine we have a source. We're going to put a slight, we're going to put like a slit, a narrow slit down over that source, which is this red one here. And even though this slit does have some actual width, let's pretend that this slit is one dimensional. So for all intents and purposes, it doesn't have a width. We're just gonna say it's, it's extremely narrow. What we're gonna do then is take the light that passes through the slit and we're gonna pass it through a dispersive element, such as a prism. And then what we will get is a two dimensional image. Now in this two dimensional image, one axis shows us wavelength and the other axis shows us space. So what that means is, if you look at the position of where the star is along the slit, at that position in our image, we have a continuum. We have a rainbow from the star. And because there are no other sources, we don't see anything else on either side of the star. But imagine, for example, then, um, sorry. So this is called long slit spectroscopy. You get a 2D image where one axis shows wavelength and the other axis shows position in the slice. If we have two stars, then you might get a 2D image that looks a bit like this, where we see two uh, continuum, we call these traces. You see two traces, one from each star. And so this image gives you a better sense of along the Y axis or the vertical axis, you're seeing position. And then along the X axis, you're seeing wavelength or color. And so imagine there was a cloud of gas between these two um, objects. If there was a cloud of gas between these two, then between the two stars, you might see these atomic emission lines. And so parsing this image is kind of, is an important part of being able to understand the more complicated instrumental method uh, that I'm gonna get to in a minute. But basically, yeah, so you see position along the y-axis. This star is this trace. This star here is the bottom trace. The cloud in the middle shows up just as narrow emission lines because the hydrogen doesn't emit at all wavelengths. Um, and so this is called long slit, long slit spectroscopy. And here are some kind of real examples of it um, where we're looking at the cosmic web or we're looking at some of the gas. And obviously, you know, when you get into this type of astronomy, unfortunately, the images suddenly become extremely low resolution and uh, we're far, far from the realm of big, beautiful simulations. We're now looking at, you know, images that are a few pixels across and uh, took us hours to obtain. So um, in the top left image here, let's say, you see a source that is extended along the, it's, it's vertically extended, but it's horizontally quite confined. So that tells us that it's extended across the whole slit, but it only has a narrow wavelength range. So this is atomic hydrogen emission that is spread over a large distance, but only appears at this one narrow wavelength range. Same thing over here on the top right. You see uh, something that's kind of extended vertically, but not extended horizontally. Now down in the bottom left, you see two things. There is this vertically extended source. That's the hydrogen emission again. But now in this frame, we also have a star or a galaxy, which is extended in wavelength. So we see this point source that covers a wide range of wavelengths and it's surrounded by this hydrogen emission that covers a wide range in space, but not in wavelength. Um, and so it takes a while when you, to, when you start, this is like a 2D spectroscopy. 
it takes a while to get used to this type of uh, data visualization because none of us are, you know, none of us are used to thinking of a spatial axis as a wavelength axis and kind of, you know, wrapping your head around it. But, um, but it is an extremely useful tool. One of the last things I'll point out on this slide is in the bottom right image, you see that this, the vertically extended source is kind of tilted. And what that means is that there's actually some Doppler shift in this source. So the, the wavelength of the source is changing as you go up. And that's actually a velocity structure. So what you're seeing here is uh, the gas moving. So I won't spend too long looking at these grainy images, but uh, generally speaking, this is kind of 2D spectroscopy and the rest of spectroscopy is kind of built, or at least the, comp the more complicated spectroscopy that uh, we use in our group is just kind of built up on this. So also to put those blobs in context, I noticed on the last slide, these are 80 kiloparsecs, 70 kiloparsecs in size, 55 kiloparsecs. Again, uh, Andromeda is uh, about radius of about 30 kiloparsecs. Uh, so one of the problems with using a slit though, is that you need to know where to put the slit. Imagine you were trying to observe gas connected to a galaxy, you know, cosmic web gas flowing into a galaxy. Unless you already know where that gas is, using a slit is gonna be quite complicated because you need to just get lucky. You need to make sure that that slit ends up lining up with the gas. Uh, there was one paper I saw that did kind of a simulation, you know, a toy model. And they said that if you just randomly place slits down, you only have about a 37% chance of finding bipolar emission. Um, and so, you know, long slit spectroscopy is great in terms of it's, uh, it's a very simple and elegant instrumental tool. But if you're looking, if you're exploring and you don't know where the emission is already, you really want to be able to cover the whole field of view and do spectroscopy at the same time. So what you really want is an image where everywhere in the image, you also have a spectrum. Uh, and so that requires some more complicated instrumentation. So the way that works is, imagine we take a field of view. So it, here you're seeing, you know, a simple field of view I made up with uh, two stars and a cloud of hydrogen kind of floating between them. And we're gonna break this up into four slits and then basically just do long slit spectroscopy on each one of those. So I label the slits here, uh, number one, number two, number three, and number four. Now, where, when we do long slit spectroscopy, it actually is a slit. When you do this, it's not really a slit, it's actually a reflective slice, but that's a minor detail we'll, we'll put aside. So we'll separate out these slits at the top, or pseudo slits as we call them. And um, for each one then, we're gonna pass it through a dispersive element and get the 2D spectrum. So for this slit on the left, for number one, we pass number one through a prism or something like that, and we get a 2D spectrum for that slice. And we can see that number one just had a star on it, so we see this trace from a star. This star might have some absorption lines. Number two has a little bit of uh, hydrogen gas and a little bit of a star on it, so we'll see a trace, and we'll also see some atomic line emission on slice number two. Slice number three also has a star and some hydrogen gas, so we'll see, again, see some, uh, the star on the left, and then we'll see some atomic emission on the right. And then number four, again, just has a star. And so what we've done is created three-dimensional data this way. So now we have, and this is, again, it's, it's one of the least intuitive kinds of astronomical instruments in terms of studying the data visually. But what you have here is you have two spatial dimensions. One is within each slice, you have the position along the slice. The other one is you know how you stacked the slices to begin with. So those are your two spatial axes. And then you also have a wavelength axis. So now you have an image where you can point to, okay, uh, let's say I'm looking down here at the kind of halfway down the 2D slice for number one. I know which slice it came from. So I know it came from over here on slice number one and I know exactly which wavelength I'm looking at. So I can pinpoint it spatially and spectrally. So this is called integral field spectroscopy. And it's essentially uh, what I've done in my PhD thesis is used integral field spectrographs to make maps of cosmic web gas emission around galaxies and quasars. 
Um, <clears throat> it's currently one of the most popular methods. I think when I started my thesis work, there was on the order of maybe 10 observations like this of the uh, cosmic web. And when I finished, uh, including my thesis work, there was about 200. Uh, so it kind of grew by an order of magnitude in terms of how big the observational field was. Uh, the image, the main instrument that I used in my thesis work was the cosmic web imager on the five meter uh, Hale telescope or 200 inch, depending on your preference, um, at Palomar. And I spent many nights there. This is some of my data where essentially what you're seeing in the bottom row are the maps of hydrogen emission around the different sources. And in the top row, you're seeing the sources before they've been removed. So the top row just shows you like a, a point source. You know, this is a galaxy. You can't really see any structure or detail in the galaxy. But my work was basically to take observations of these distant galaxies. These galaxies are in the distant universe about 10 to 12 billion light years ago, or <laughs> 10 to 12 billion years ago, or 10 to 12 billion light years away. And I was studying the hydrogen gas around these uh, objects connected to the cosmic web in order to understand how that gas fueled their formation and their evolution. Uh, but before I finish up on this, I think one, of the, one observation that deserves a lot of attention is there's a recent observation uh, using integral field spectroscopy by uh, Umahada et al. I think it was last year. And what, they, what you can see here, if you, know, if you recall the simulation videos earlier on, they've actually mapped out some filaments of the cosmic web on a pretty large scale. This is about, I think, a megaparsec in size. Uh, and so megaparsec is the scale of the cosmic web. So that, that's a very large scale. Each one of these dots is a galaxy, uh, as in the, these bright dots here. So this is still illuminated by galaxies, but it's still one of the largest detections, visual detections and direct detections we have, the cosmic web. So we're entering, this is only just last year, so we're kind of entering a new observational era these days where we can actually observe the large scale structure of the universe. And this observation is one of the first of its kind. Uh, my thesis was kind of the first set of observations at a particular time in the universe. But collectively as a field, we're really getting into a place where only in the last six, seven years have we been able to see this gas in emission. And uh, it's kind of something that people have wanted to observe since they first learned about the cosmic web in the 50s or 60s. So it's one of those things that's been a real technological barrier, just do we have big enough telescopes and good enough instruments? And in the last few years, since I think the Co Palomar Cosmic Web Imager was installed in 2009, um, went through some teething problems, I think until you know, a little while later, but it took me four years or five years to collect my data and get this stuff done. So only in the last five years or so have we started to see large volumes of data come out um, where you're actually constraining the, the cosmic web. So I'm going to leave a kind of want to leave a summary up here of the kind of what the large scale structure is, how we observe it. I I'm, hope I haven't gone too much over time or too much under time. No, no, you're fine. But I do want to hopefully can leave some time for questions. I know there's some stuff I skipped over. There's some stuff I simplified, maybe too much. So please feel free to uh, ask me any questions you want. I have, yeah, no time constraints on my end. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Donald, first of all, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, we open, we open the floor for questions. Okay, I'll ask one. <laughs> this cosmic web is transporting the supply, if you will, of hydrogen gas from lesser dense to greater density concentrations. Mm -hmm. Is it thinning out over time? Yeah, that's a great question. So essentially, you know, one of the things when we talk about this transport or this kind of fueling of, you could think, I think transport is a great word for it because in a lot of ways, when we talk about this in astrophysics, we talk about this gas as fuel because this, this cold neutral hydrogen gas is the fuel you need to form stars and planets. And, you know, obviously as a very human centric perspective, we care a lot about the formation of stars and planets. And so we're pretty concerned with how does this gas get into galaxies? And once it gets into galaxies, how does it form stars and planets? So th the neutral component of the gas over time, because you have, uh, there's, this, there's this process called feedback, where imagine there's a galaxy in the early universe 
and some of the gas flows into that galaxy. Okay. And, then it, and, then it, and then it forms stars in the galaxy. Now those stars are going to start emitting really hard radiation, like really like X-rays and ultraviolet radiation back out into space. And that radiation ionizes the neutral gas that's surrounding it. So what happens is the formation of stars and the formation of black holes ends up disrupting the cool gas supply and starts thinning out the cool gas in intergalactic space. And so over time, all that neutral, ga neutral gas, the neutral cold hydrogen, starts to be disrupted and thinned out because of radiation from stars and galaxies, as well as uh, explosions like supernovae and uh, feedback from black holes, like the big energetic jets from black holes. All of these energetic processes heat up and ionize the gas that's in the cosmic web until there's no neutral gas left. Um, I have a question, or maybe two. Uh, first of all, can you tell me about uh, at what scale does the dark matter rule the universe, and what is, and what, at what scale does the dark energy rule? Uh, Ooh, that's a good question. I, I can't. Let's see. I can tell you that the dark matter stuff is is more in my uh, my field, and I can answer that a bit more confidently. When I when I get into dark energy, it's it's you know I. I'd learn a lot from Wikipedia just reading the page. Like there's, uh, it's, not, it's not really in my uh, uh, area. But let's say, so to start with dark matter. Dark matter dominates on kind of galactic scales. So one of the earliest pieces of evidence for dark matter was when people looked at the rotation of galaxies. And what they wanted to see or what they were looking at was, okay, well, we know Keplerian rotate. We know how gravity works, right? So we should be able to predict what the rotation of a galaxy would look like based on the material that we can see in the galaxy. If there's this much mass, then this is how fast it should be rotating. And so they look at these, they look at the galaxies and they mapped out based on the visible material, what the rotation profile should look like. And in the center, it, it lines up pretty well. The, uh, the center may be a few kiloparsecs or 10 kiloparsecs of the galaxy. The, it rotates about what you'd expect. But once you get outside the galaxy a little bit on the order of tens of kiloparsecs, suddenly the velocity doesn't drop off as quick as you would expect it to. Um, the velocity actually kind of levels out, implying that there is more material there than you can see. And so this early on, people were debating over, okay, are the rotation curves wrong? Or is there, are there more planets or black holes than we can see? Or is there a new entirely exotic type of material that we just can't see? And uh, so that's a long way of saying that once you get outside the scope of like a galaxy on those kind of slightly larger than galaxy scale, that's when dark matter starts to dominate the gravity um, of, of, uh, of a galaxy. And in terms of dark energy, uh, my impression is that that's on a, on a much larger scale. So, you know, you have this expansion of the universe that's driven by the kind of um, dark energy and on, on small scales where things are gravitationally bound, they don't really get pulled apart. But on larger, larger scales where things are not really even, I'm not sure if it's like causally connected or not, that, you know, distant galaxies that are not gravitationally bound together uh, get pulled apart by the expansion of the universe. So in a sense, you could say that maybe a galaxy cluster scale where they're all gravitationally bound together is one where dark energy isn't important. But on larger scales, dark energy becomes more important because it can separate things out. Thank you. And the scale that you're talking about is, is your study is on, is this the uh, super, super cluster of galaxies or I've heard about this new thing you called Laniakea. Uh, how, how does that, where does that come into play? I think, is Laniakea, it is a super cluster or is that the name of a super cluster? I'm not as familiar with it, but the, the observations that I would have is if you look at this slide that's up here, kind of just like this central nodule, right, would be the scale that we're observing. Um, so we're observing maybe a cluster of galaxies, not even a super cluster, because one of the difficulties with this observational method uh, is field of view, getting like a big, so you know the, how I, I was showing earlier on, you divide your field of view up into slices? Well, yeah. In order to do that for a really large field of view, you either need really thick slices or you need a lot of slices. 
right? Because the, each of them needs to cover a large area or you need a lot of thin slices. And that becomes really expensive to fit all of those spectra on a detector. Uh, so it actually becomes like a spatial constraint. It's really difficult to make a big, uh, an instrument that does this type of spectroscopy for a large, large field of view. And that's another advantage to narrowband imaging. A narrowband imager can have a very large field of view. So if you knew exactly, you know, if you wanted to observe things on a supercluster scale or like a megaparsec filament scale, like one of these, see one of these filaments here, your best bet might be to, uh, at the moment, identify what the wavelength of the emission is, create a narrowband filter for it, and then uh, take an image with a, a big telescope and not an integral field spectrograph. On your uh, on, on the CWI instrument, uh, are slices implemented in hardware or is it slice and dice done with software? Yeah, let, let me show you. I think I have a backup slide here somewhere um, that has an image. So this is an image of the slicer. So what, what you have on the, on the left here is basically, it's a little aluminum block that you put in the focal plane. And each slice redirects a portion of the field of view to uh, another mirror. So you're, you're cho you're, in hardware, you're chopping up the field of view into these little aluminum slices and then reflecting that light off to, uh, so this little block here in, in figure A is positioned over here kind of in the middle of figure B. And what happens is the light comes in, it hits that little block, and then each slice gets redirected to one of these pupil mirrors. And so there's actually this whole optical setup for chopping up the field of view into uh, smaller components. And then each of those gets kind of rearranged and put through a dispersive element. So all of your starlight is bouncing off the edge of little aluminum sheets? Yes. Okay. With, uh, you know, hopefully with good... Ref it doesn't seem as elegant as the um, Hale telescope mirror. Not quite. Well, it depends on your definition of elegance, I guess. Um, you know, if you... What I think is elegant about this is uh, it, this is not the kind of thing that you could really do in post-processing necessarily. Um, because it might, if you just took a whole field of view and then put it through a prism, what you would get is uh, that whole field of view would be kind of smeared out in different wavelengths. And it would be very, very difficult to kind of extract the different images of it from one another uh, because you'd have overlapping spatial and spectral information. Uh, and so what you what is nice about this kind of design is it lets you <clears throat> uh, It lets you kind of you know split up your field of view get a spectrum for each size that the, the post-processing side then is on reconstructing the 3d data But what's nice is that you know, you don't have to do any very complicated extraction. It's all It's all kind of done in real time by the optics and what's the range of uh, the number of slices that you can implement? So it depends on your budget. Um, <laughs> so in the, in the Palomar Cosmic Web Imager, there are 24 slices. Um, there is a, you know, a behemoth of an instrument in, in the, at the European Southern Observatory that the European Union threw a ton of money at, and it's called, the, it's called MUSE, the Multi-Unit Spectroscopic uh, Explorer. And it has 24 separate it's basically 24 separate instruments in one big instrument. And each of those has 24 slices or something like that. So that one, that instrument has, it's really just kind of, you know, how much money and time can you throw at uh, designing your instrument? Because you could keep adding slices, it just gets very expensive. Thank you. Yeah. Do you lose light through the splicer compared to a long slit spectrograph? Yeah. So one of the major trade-offs of integral field spectroscopy are, is the kind of complexity of the optics. And, you know, as a general rule, the more surfaces you add to an instrument, the more light you lose. Uh, so, I mean, spectrographs in general tend to have their biggest losses in the dispersive elements, uh, like prisms or gratings tend to be lower efficiency than, you know, mirrors. Um, so yes, you do lose extra light because of your um, <clears throat> because of your uh, additional reflective elements in an integral field spectrograph. But compared to a long slit spectroscope or a, a spectrograph, I 
I don't think it's huge. I think it's pretty big compared to an imager. Like you, you're looking at a total end-to-end -end throughput of about 30%. Hmm. Other questions? Other questions? Do I understand correctly that matter in the cosmic web is being concentrated over over billions of years and my real question is what if that is correct what is that telling us about the fate of the universe <laughs> yeah um so it really depends so first of all yes that that is correct um basically what happens is the universe is undergoing this process of kind of runaway collapse this positive feedback loop of regions that are more dense have a larger gravitational pull that leads to them being even more dense with an even larger gravitational pull. And so it just keeps going. It's kind of like how a star collapses. A star ultimately crosses this threshold where, um, you know, it, it gets more dense. It has more gravity. It gets more dense. It has more gravity and it just keeps going. The same thing is happening to a, you know, a less dramatic extent uh, with the cosmic web. And what it tells us in general, as we've seen, as we, one of the good things about, you know, studying distant sources that we can study the evolution of the universe by looking at distant sources, because we're seeing them as they were a long time ago. And one of the things we can tell about the cosmic web is that it, it has gone from a state of being a lot of, you know, cool, neutral hydrogen filling up intergalactic space to, you know, flowing into galaxies, forming stars, becoming much more, uh, much hotter more ionized, more enriched by heavy elements like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. So if we were to extrapolate that forward, you know, in the future, we expect probably that the cosmic web will have little to no uh, cool gas remaining in it. And it would be much more enriched because they would have more and more generations of stars pumping out heavy elements. Um, and, you know, depending on your you know, it gets speculative when you start to talk about really large timescales because then it gets into a question of does the universe keep expanding or does it, you know, contract again? But if the universe, let's say, stays steady or keeps expanding, at some point then you look at the heat death of the universe where, you know, there are no, there's no more fuel to form stars. Everything is in black holes or, you know, tiny red dwarfs that burn for trillions of years. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it doesn't paint a great picture. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of, you know, but luckily we won't. I know, that's probably in a billions of years ahead. Uh, I have a question. In the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that we, the simulations and, well, your simulations begin at 180 million years after the Big Bang, which is essentially right with it. And then you said it's almost, and I emphasize the word, almost uniformly distributed. Yeah. So, so, uh, from that point on, it's very easy to imagine the, how the structure forms by the runaway process, gravitational process you just described. But what are the theories about the original non-homogeneity of, the, let's say, the starting groove, if you will? Yeah, so that, that is referred to typically as anisotropy, um, uh, as opposed to you know, something as isotropic, this is anisotropic. And so one of the, I think I have a, slide here somewhere i had a lot of backup yeah here we go so this is a map of the cosmic microwave background radiation this is from uh only moments after the big bang so essentially we we see this background radiation surrounding us it's it's kind of like the big bang happened everywhere at the same time so some radiation is still reaching us from very very distant parts of the universe where like we're just now seeing the big bang happen in that place really far away um and so well that's how we map out this early conditions of the universe this is the first these are essentially the first photons that were able to travel freely through the universe so it's the kind of earliest map of the universe you can make and um what you see here is that these red and blue regions they're only you know 0 0.0002 degrees i think in in terms of the difference and the whole map has a rough temperature of 2.73 degrees kelvin and as far as I'm aware, um, the initial perturbations 
are kind of blown up quantum uncertainties from the very, very big bang. So in the very before the inflation period of the big bangs, so before the real kind of the bang itself, you have this hot, dense quantum soup and it's pretty much all the same temperature density, but there's quantum fluctuations within that. And when inflation happened, when this big bang happened, suddenly you have uh, those things that were quantum scale before are now on the scale of galaxies. Right. Uh, so, so, yeah, so it's, it's a little like a probability density picture. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think it's probabilistic, but um, that, that's my best understanding of it. I think one of the most yeah. interesting things about it is, you know, part of the strongest evidence we have for the Big Bang comes from the fact that the cosmic microwave background radiation is all so uniform. Like, it, it would be impossible for it all to be so uniform if it hadn't been causally connected. Because it would be very unusual to look everywhere in the universe, at like a region over there that is totally disconnected from a region over there, and see that they're the exact same temperature for some reason. Um, so that's one of the big pieces of evidence we have for inflation and for like this kind of early expansion of the universe is that uh, all of this stuff that we now see is like the largest extent we can see is all the exact same temperature. So it has to have all been connected at some point. Thank you. Oh. <clears throat> Will the structure or the geometry of this cosmic web change over time? I'm imagining uh, minute differences in gravity at the early uh, universe, and that produced this. Gravity is like a difference in potential in electricity, and so you get a geometry for the transport, but now we've got much bigger sources that are radiating a huge amount of energy. Does that is that going to morph the geometry? I think so. Yeah, I think one of the one of the core kind of concepts of the structure for, of of what we call structure formation or like large scale structure formation is uh, hierarchical growth. So basically, in the early universe, you can imagine there were all of these small pockets of dark matter, right? And they all came from the initial fluctuations, the initial perturbations. But over time, they, they start to meld together and they start to coalesce and form bigger and bigger dark matter halos. And so this combining of different uh, dark matter structures into larger and larger dark matter structures, we call it hierarchical growth. And one of the kind of consequences of this growth is that the farther along you go in the universe, the more and more massive these environments become. So whereas in the very early universe, it would have been extremely rare to see, you know, a dark matter halo that is 10 to the 13 solar masses or something like that in mass uh, in the present universe it's much more likely because there's been this history of things merging together and one of the consequences that has on the structure of the cosmic web is that these much more massive environments uh contain you know much more energetic radiation there's like this kind of uh what we call synchrotron or free free electron radiation, but basically more massive environments are more energetic and more energetic things tend to exhibit uh, radiation. And so you get this kind of hot gas resulting from these clusters and that disrupts the cool gas of the, of the cosmic web. So I would expect over time, these filaments of cool gas start to break up and all of the gas starts to end up in these clumps. Uh, and those clumps end up probably drifting farther and farther apart because of the expansion of the universe if that continues. Uh, so probably you end up with just different pockets that are separated uh, as opposed to these big stringy filaments. Thank you. So um, I don't remember what year it was, but uh, Brian Schmidt and uh, Sol per Perlmutter, I think, uh, found that the the rate of expansion of the universe is increasing. Um, the, and so my, I, I guess uh, my question is two parts. So one, does that mean that there's a time dependence of the cosmological constant in the, I guess it's, I'm not sure what the set of equations are called. One is that time, is that cosmological constant time dependence? And two, 
does the evolution of the cosmic web tell us something about that time dependence also? Hmm. So that is a fantastic question. I honestly, my, my, my first like disclaimer is that uh, that is a complicated question that I do not know the answer to. Um, okay. It's like, it's a fairly advanced uh, idea. So essentially, my gut feeling based on my experience in astrophysics would tell me that yes, if we could get great knowledge of like the history of the cosmic web and the expansion of that structure, we could use that to extrapolate in like, you know, lessons about what the universe is made up of, what the different, like, you know, what the baryonic mass is versus the dark matter mass versus the cosmological constant. In terms of whether or not the cosmological constant is varying with time, um, I don't believe so. I think, at least in terms of how we typically treat models, I think we typically look at the evolution of the universe within a certain context. So we say, okay, let's look at uh, you know an Einstein de Sitter universe, which is uh, you know all made up. I think the the mass omega for the mass or the mass fraction is one. And so typically, when we explore different cosmological models, I think we like fix the cosmological parameters and then see what kind of evolution that leads to. Um, now, I'm sure, I'm sure there are people out there studying what happens if you allow them to vary. Um, and I don't know whether or not that is a common thing or whether that's, yeah, basically that just gets beyond my knowledge. Um, but it's, it's a fascinating question. I, I need to look it up now. <laughs> so that's, that's somebody else's thesis. Yeah, you guys need to get some theorist in here who works on... Uh, uh, you know, like the Big Bang and works on cosmological parameters. Oh, get somebody from um, like the BICEP teams, the teams studying the, uh, the microwave background radiation. They're the experts on this stuff. Well, if there are no other questions, again, Donald Sullivan, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And, um, let me point out next next week our our next session is next week um next time mike burton will talk about the role palomar observatory has played in our nation's popular culture talk about moving from the sublime to the ridiculous <laughs> Does uh, Palomar have its own rock band? Excuse me? Does Palomar have its own band? We've we've got a band up at Mount Wilson. Do you guys have a band? <laughs> we did once. Not that I know of. It's an idea. <laughs> um, but Mike Mike's gonna show us many of the artifacts. Um uh, sci-fi movie clips, cartoons, advertising campaigns. <clears throat> in which Palomar has appeared over the years. Um, and mu music is one of the things. There's some very, very weird music that Palomar Observatory has inspired. And you'll, you'll hear mercifully short clips of that music. Well, and some, some really cheesy sci-fi <laughs> movies. But they're fun. We got clips of them. They're fun. Um, but the schedule got altered a little bit. So instead of going two weeks, Mike's presentation will be one week from today. And I'll send out the invitations um, like tomorrow, probably. OK? Um, and with that, there are other comments. Probably time to bring the meeting to a close. Other things. Hey, really, hey, everybody, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for supporting the program. And I hope we can see you next Saturday. Okay? Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. All right.